Oh, you want to introduce her? Yeah, this is Gary Carter. Everybody. <laughs> <laughs> She's the author of uh, Joy Road, which is the book that uh, we're passing around here, and uh, owner of PepperAdams.com. He knows everything about Pepper Adams. If you want to know the color of his underwear? <laughs> no, this no. guy knows it. Or I'd say I didn't know. But, you know what I mean? <laughs> but um, it's been a pleasure. We've come up. Yeah, it's been great. Twenty-four hours. Tremendous host. Well, Thomas is a tremendous host. It's been great. It's a great, so, um, great thing you got going on here. I think the plan is he's going to talk for 20 minutes. And sure. Then we're going to play a set of Pepper's music. And yeah. Right. We're going to keep it like that. So. Thank you. Start. Thank you. Right. So yeah. So I met Pepper Adams in 1984. Famous year for literary reasons too. And it turned out that I was doing a master's thesis in English, and I had to do an oral, a, a oral history of a jazz musician as part of the thesis. I sent out five letters, and he was the only one who responded. And it turned out that we had a mutual friend. Uh, he was very, very close with the band leader, Thad Jones, because he was a fellow in Troyer. And I went to school, grade school with Thad Jones' son. He was in my seventh grade class. So I think what happened, I think that and the fact that I brought a really good bottle of sparkling burgundy, oh, or a brute, or whatever it was, to his house, and he was a drinker, because I noticed, I noticed this shift in his mood. I'm like, oh, well, should we drink this? Oh, it's great. <laughs> Uh, it was a hot June day. So we hit it off. We, uh, I proceeded to do 18 hours of interview with him that, that summer. Uh, it was fascinating. He was very prepared. He had run himself over with his own car that, earlier that year, which is not easy to do. And consequently, he had a crush injury and was really laid up about 22 out of 24 hours a day in his basement. Dreary as, as heck. And uh, smoking camel straights, which is what he always did anyway, but he wasn't playing, he wasn't ambulatory, and he was depressed, and his marriage was failing, and it was just a horrible experience for him. But I, I saw him as he was coming out of that, and he said, yeah, you know, come on over when the orthopedist tells me, that tells me I can get around, and he started getting around in a gimpy fashion, he usually came for a while. So we did these interviews, um, and then the following year, he went to Canada on tour and then to Sweden. And his lung cancer was discovered in Sweden that, that, uh, that March. He had a friend who didn't like the way he looked and asked him to come up for a chest x-ray. Just thought his eyes were watery and he looked a little weak and, and pale. Of course, he was always kind of weak and pale looking. I don't know if anybody's gone to pepperadams.com and taken a look at Pepper Adams. Uh, he was 5'10", but very wiry. And that's also part of the appeal and why he was so... And, and um, Anders can tell you, he didn't have a frame like Anders. He wasn't built like the prototypical baritone player. And yet he played with so much power and really revolutionized the instrument. So this book is an outgrowth of the interviews that I did with Pepper. But at, he passed away in September of 86 at the age of 55, just short of his 56th birthday, after 30 years in, 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 as a musician playing professionally. And I continued to... Um, I interviewed musicians because I knew that now that Pepper was gone, it obviously couldn't be an assisted autobiography. It had to be some other kind of book. What I promised him when I spoke to him about three weeks after before he passed away is that I would do a biography. I had no idea that I'd be such a compulsive person and spend 35 years doing all this stuff. <laughs> but um, but it, his life was so rich, his music is so rich, his, um, his playing is so rich, and he was one of the most beloved people in the industry. People just adored him because he was so self-effacing, so humble, so polite. I mean, if, if, if there ever was a gentleman in music, he was a gentleman. And um, just just beloved. So, uh, th so this book was the first thing I did. Actually, before that, I did some of these recordings. I decided to spend my savings and produce his entire oeuvre of 43 compositions and four CDs, mostly Chicago group uh, family people, musicians. And then uh, it occurred to me that after I did that, Pepper really wanted, at his death, really wanted uh, lyrics written to his ballads. So I figured, oh, that's another 20 grand, you know? So I did that, and um, but it was, it was really well worth it. And the recording came out really well. So that's, uh, so this is a sampler in my <coughs> continuing effort to make $10. This is a sampler of the first five CDs that I produced, and then this is the fifth CD that was commercially released by Montana Records came out as a box set at the same time that this book came out. It was really good that they did that, because even though I self-produced them, they took it upon them to take my work and then put it in a box set. But they said, you know, I think we'll do a lot better if you finish your book finally. You know, it had been 27 years by then, and I really needed the kick in the butt to get going and get this done. 
And what makes this book unique is that it's, it's what's known as a discography. You probably know what a discography is in the industry. It's basically a catalog of recordings. So it's kind of a jazz fan's book. And so it lists all the records and all of the uh, audience recordings that he was, he was captured on and uh, videos, but it also includes everything that I found in his date books, because I went in, because I, I was working with Pepper, I his widow let me go in and get all his materials, which is fantastic. So consequently, um, I had, uh, and I went into one of those closets had recordings that had never been found before, uh, never known about before, Pepper didn't tell me about them when I, when he, when I interviewed him, I found, I pushed his discography back from his first known recording in 55, back in 1947 when he was a 16 year old kid, still a clarinet player, not a baritone player, that pre preceded his baritone, adoption of baritone by about four months. But anyway, it, uh, the few things that I did in this book was, obviously yes, it was very compulsive. I listed all the sessions, all the issues, all that kind of stuff, because that's, that's kind of the science of discography. But what I did do, since he was a side man, and that's possibly one of the reasons why a lot of people haven't really heard of him, because he works so much as a side man, is I, um, as you can see, there's some, this book's falling apart, it's got so much use. You can see there's some bold type here, and those are the, the tunes that he solos in. So if you don't want to pick up a record by Sonny and Cher, for example, or the Cowstills, which he actually worked, he actually did as a session guy, because he's certainly not going to solo on them, then it's more likely to turn to a page that says, oh, Barry Harris, or Bad Jones, Mel Lewis, and you'll see the, the um, bold face. And then additionally, um, I spent two extra years transcribing interview material, because I went on to do about 300 interviews with, with musicians and bystanders and friends and family members and so forth, people off in the wings too, who witnessed what Pepper was doing. And it occurred to me, I always knew I was going to do the biography, that was my goal from the, from the get-go. But this has sort of gotten away, and so did PepperAdams.com. But it occurred to me that some of the material in my interviews would be not germane for a biography, just too much minutia, but it was historically valid here. And so I'm going to share with you a few of those things, um, and then I'll, I'll turn it over to the band. We've got a great band here tonight playing Pepper Adams tunes. It's always a great pleasure to hear that, hear Pepper Adams music. So um, well, let, me, let me start, I'll do this sort of chronologically. When I interviewed Pepper, he told me, how are we doing on time? We're good. Okay. Yeah. So we, um, we talked about why he wasn't known and wh what was the perception of his playing when he first came to New York. He came to New York in January of 56, was on the scene, um, new in the scene with all, a lot of the other Detroiters like Tommy Flanagan and, Ken and Kenny Burrell. But he tried to land a record deal with either Blue Note Records or, or um, Prestige Records in 55. And he did a demo record in Detroit with, with Barry Harris and Elvin Jones. You probably know Elvin Jones, Coltrane's drummer. And he said, he played it for both of them, and neither of them would take it. He said, and then he said that Alfred Lyon's response at Blue Note Records was really interesting. And it was an indication about why he got such a hostile response from the jazz critics throughout his career until it was undeniable in, in the late 70s when I went on his own that he was such an influence they couldn't deny <coughs> that he was really different and uh, arguably a much better soloist than Jerry Mulligan, who was the exemplar of the uh, such a different instrumentalist. He said, Lyons' reaction to Adams is, well, this is me writing, but I'll quote Pepper. Lyons' reaction to Adams is playing was very interesting, Adams told me in 1984. Uh, something that might explain some of the negative reactions that critics felt toward my playing, which didn't seem to be necessarily shared by musicians for the most part, nor by the public. <coughs> Lion Adams said, refused to believe it was him playing. That's not you, Lion said. Now, Pepper was white, okay? <coughs> he said, that's not you. That's a black baritone player. You're lying. That's not you. Can you imagine that? <laughs> it's incredible. He said, you're, and, and another thing Alfred said, Adams continued, is you know, that's a black baritone player who's a rhythm and blues player trying to learn how to play jazz. <laughs> and Pepper went on to tell me, now that's sort of a clue to me to what I think confused critics to a great extent, made them so violently antagonistic to the way I played. My feeling is to play with a strong swing sense, a really strong rhythmic bass, and to play with a sophisticated harmonic approach. And I think to many critics, these are supposed to be two antithetical things. The people that play with a real strong swing are supposed to be straight ahead basic players, and the people that play with a sophisticated harmonic approach are supposed to be the intellectual players that don't swing. So if you get someone doing 
both these things at once, there's obviously something very wrong with them. <laughs> and and um, yeah, the, the, the Pepper was always trying to figure out why the players loved them and why he, was, why he just couldn't get a record deal. And he did get some, and he was certainly the first call for a lot of musicians. So I have stuff from Pepper speaking about his work. Obviously, that was a piece of it. And then I also have a, a lot of material from the interview materials that, that, uh, that I did. So um, some of you have probably heard the Polonius Monk at Town Hall recording, the famous recording, a little over to I know that Ben Citrin in his radio interview spoke about that and, and discussed it with Pepper Adam. Um, yeah, this is kind of interesting. I, I did an interview with the trombonist of that band, Eddie Burke, and he said that uh, we rehearsed at Hall Overton at Sixth Avenue. Now that was a pretty cool place in the Flower District in New York. Pepper used to call a Hall Overton tall overcoat. But that was also the building that Eugene Smith, a very famous photographer, li lived in. He lived right upstairs. And he would tape and photograph a lot of these guys. So this th the monk thing um, was in Hall's pad up on the second floor. We rehearsed for about a month for that Tom Hall thing. It was a lot of work. I think that Hall Overton did an amazing job on the arrangements. We caught Monk just the way Monk was. He did a great job. At that point, the music was very new. What Overton did was transcribe Monk's choruses and the melodies naturally, but some of Monk's choruses were transcribed for that instrumentation. At most of the rehearsal, Hall played the piano. I remember there was at one point where Hall said, hey, Monk, <coughs> Monk was in the other room we were rehearsing. He said, Monk, you ever gonna play the piano parts? So Monk, Monk said, I'm dancing. <laughs> I want to make sure the band is getting the, the right beat. He was in the other room dancing because that's the way he fills the band. So he never participated in his own band's rehearsals. He was just in the other room dancing. And he was famous for playing the, um, the five spot and looking at himself closely in the mirror and dancing. And uh, you know, he was a, re if you've seen the films on Monk, he was a reasonably eccentric guy. And you can tell that from the music, but you can, there's a lot of humor in that music too. Uh, then, does anyone, has anybody heard the Monk, I'm sorry, the Charles Mingus at Town Hall date? <laughs> it's pretty famous, uh, famous as being one of the great fiascos in music history. <laughs> Yeah, I interviewed the great trumpeter Clark Terry about that. He said, we were hired by Mingus, we were told it was a concert at Town Hall, so the dress we assumed, or maybe we were told, was tuxedo black tie. Prior to that, there was an awful lot of confusion because the music which was written for this concert never was sufficiently rehearsed. It was just ridiculous trying to get through it. Uh, Mingus had a 35-piece orchestra. Wow. And it was supposed to, they were supposed to play on a certain date, and for some reason, the uh, producer, um, I can't remember his name, Dave Douglas, Douglas, no, I can't remember right now, moved the time up five weeks and they put a lot of stress on Mingus to get all this ready. And he was already severely ADD. And so this really, really put a lot of stress on him. That was the time when he slapped Jimmy Nepper in the face and knocked his front tooth out and said he lost the range of an octave and had a, a, a civil action suit in the New York uh, courts. But so there's a lot of confusion because the music was never sufficiently rehearsed. It was just ridiculous trying to get through it. I don't know if it was because of the copying or the late arrival of parts or what the heck it was, but it was catastrophic. It was obvious. Before we opened that curtain, we were not going to perform a concert that night with that music. So we walk on the stage. Nobody had actually seen Mingus the last minutes before a curtain time, assuming that everybody was going to at the last minute get presentable for the concert, whatever they got to do. Mingus had on dungarees and everything backstage. <laughs> When the curtain came up, he walks out on the stage with the same garb that he wore backstage, sweatshirt, dungarees, tennis shoes, and whatnot, just like he would out in his backyard. And we're in town hall. He walks up to the mic and says, if I remember correctly, I don't know exactly where it's something to this effect. Well, I don't know what you folks are out here for tonight, but we came to work. This is a record date, which of course shocked the hell out of us behind the curtain. We had no idea, none whatsoever. And he goes on and on, but he said it was the most bizarre. He said it was really a total effed up afternoon. And it was the most bizarre and chaotic scene I have ever witnessed. <laughs> and uh, uh, half the audience left because they thought it was going to be a concert and turn out to be a record scene. <laughs> Any questions about Pepper or my work? Or, and I'll, I'll leave you with one last quote. But um, anybody have any comments or questions? When was he born? 1930. Good. So in the, in the dark of the Depression, his dad was a furniture salesman for a very large furniture store in downtown Detroit. And uh, within nine months, they lost the house, they lost the savings, he lost all back salary, and they had a scramble. So Pepper and his mom went to central Indiana where her family was from, and he lived there for about three years with her family. 
and his father just rode the rails looking for work in upstate New York. Eventually, they got back together in 1934. Just before they were supposed to get together, his father suffered a major heart attack mm -hmm. and had to convalesce. I guess it was just too exciting, too much for them, the family to finally get together. Uh, or, or, uh, uh, yeah, or, I don't know. But he suffered a major heart attack. He then died of a heart attack in 39. And Pepper was an only child, very much alone. Isolation is something that colored his entire life. And, um, and one thing I do want to say is, although I'm writing a biography, I just want to stress this is not a biography. I think I said this already. Biography, this is not a biography per se, because I understand that it, that magazine that it, it said it was, a, uh, it was a biography, so I don't want you to, it's not a bait and switch or anything. So he, yeah, he died in 86 and um, had a very active life. This book talks about about 650 sessions that he did. Admittedly, about a quarter of them are during the Walkman era when a lot of people were bringing in Walkmans and doing tapes and clubs. And I was able to get all of Pepper Adams' cassettes. And uh, a lot of this is, all of them are in this book, but some of his best music is the kind of music you're going to hear tonight, which is a band unfettered by commercial pressures, just playing, letting loose. And that's really the, when Pepper was the most experimental. I understand that's where Andrew Spano is the most experimental. <laughs> so you're in for a treat with this band, great rhythm section. Um, yeah, the last thing I'll read is a quote from, any other questions? Yeah, why did he decide to become a musician to pick up an instrument? That's a really good question. He, he um, learned how to play piano when he was three, he said. And he also had a trum an uncle who played trombone, he said it was a lush. He didn't really elaborate. He didn't have too many musicians in the family. He had one uncle who was a bassist, who allegedly got, he was so good that he was able to play, he won a contest in New York State, it's kind of murky, but won a contest to play with, I think, the Chicago Symphony Orchestra. And then just became an alcoholic and just moved to Chicago. We don't really know what happened to him. Um, and um, I think that Pepper just really loved music because he was surrounded by music from his family because his parents really liked music of all sorts and there were a lot of records. And, and also, and some of you might remember, I mean, the 30s, 40s, maybe you don't remember that, but the 30s and 40s were almost the golden age of radio in the United States where there's constant concerts, constant music on the air. And uh, so he was exposed to a lot of different music at that time and really became a huge fan of classical music, and that's what he mostly listened to when he was listening to records later on. And that then, with that in his head, he started listening for more sophisticated harmonic music, if I can put it that way. And thus Ellington became a real appeal to him because he felt that the Ellington's, Ellington's tonal palettes were what he was listening to in 20th century classical music. And so when he was 12 years old, right around the time that he started playing, like sixth grade is when he, he finally got an instrument, a clarinet, and then a saxophone took a few lessons. He had the good fortune of hearing the Duke Ellington Orchestra in Rochester, New York, where he grew up. And then, I don't know what happened, but he somehow found where the musicians were and introduced himself to the great trumpeter, cornetist actually, Rex Stewart, who was in the Ellington band. And Rex Stewart became a lifelong friend and father figure of Pepper Adams. Again, he lost his dad when he was nine and never really knew him. The only thing he remembered about his dad is he was a great horseman. He somehow rode a pal Palomino horse up marble steps of a big hotel in downtown Detroit. <laughs> and that was, that was a legendary, that's not easy to get a horse to do that, right? He's some kind of prank or something. Yes? Here, your book appeared, in, you know, in the 30 seconds of the book, it looks like it's a mind-boggling <laughs> compilation of information. Oh, did, thank did you. you. <laughs> did you. Did you do this? This was, you started before computers, right? I started, a, yeah, I started a little of it during my coursework at Tufts when I was going for a master's in music. So it was, it was like peck and type and just stripping it in. But then ultimately I got a Mac Plus in 1989 and started doing it with that. So most of it was done on a computer. Because I just did it, I, I looked in the index in the back and I quick look at John Coltrane. It's got page 34, 35, 42, and 46. And I go to 35 and John Coltrane's name is there. And I'm thinking, I can't imagine how you... Well, I didn't do the index. Uh, I could say that the index is not up to the level of the rest of the stuff, by the way. So if any of you get this book, don't depend on the index. But um, it was just a lot of work, a lot of work. Amazing. Yeah, well, thank you. Other than the book you have tonight, it was yeah. uh, where else is your book available? Amazon, <clears throat> certainly. 
It's 40 bucks, I think, or 42 bucks. Yeah. Paperback. The paperback edition is what I brought with me. It's obviously cheaper and it's got the better index, so I fixed it. The reason I had to fix it is because I had to, this is camera ready copy, and my printer broke in the middle of printing it. And I had to then use another printer, and, and all the pagination got off a page, or it was just a mess. <laughs> but the data's good. <laughs> yes. Tom, Thomas. Can you talk about the Detroit? Jim yeah, sure. I, I would love to do that. Yeah. yeah. And, so, yeah. And, and and who were the players? Yeah. You know, who were the cats? Yeah. And then, was there any cross pollination between them and Motown? Was there? Anything yes. There? Yeah. Great, great three part question. So, um, in in the biography that I'm almost done with, I did a very extensive. Well, big surprise, right? I'm using the word extensive. Now, I did a <laughs> um, an overview of the history of Detroit jazz from 1922 to 1950 what was going on. And I also did a, a description of the clubs in Detroit. The uh, famous one is the Bluebird Kleins, a West End hotel where people from out of town, the, the, the big ego players from New York would come and get slaughtered after hours. The reason I stress that is Detroit, the post-war scene in Detroit was by far the heaviest scene in jazz. There's no question about it. I interviewed the bass player, um, Major Holly, who's about a half a generation older, and he said, we were like hyenas, we were like vultures, we would just wait for them to show up, and <laughs> wipe them off the stage. And the reason why, I, I've been, it always confused me or puzzled me, it was like the big question, why Detroit, why was it so great, especially, was, uh, well, yeah. are you asking? No, I'm not. <laughs> no, 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 I was asking myself, and I was asking a million people, Affluence, personally, you know. And well, I think it was the auto industry. There was a great migration out of Appalachia, right, for the jobs, right, and, and the South, and also from Europe. Well, yeah, yeah, the great migration, but it was an extremely affluent city. Um, the African American population there was the most affluent in the United States in the fifties by far. Um, people had work; they had money in their pockets; they had money to burn. You know, when Pepper, essentially when, when Pepper's cohort, that post-war cohort, left for New York in 55 and 56, it was coming to the end. Deindustrialization was starting to rear its ugly head in Detroit. But historically, Detroit was a very affluent city. It was very progressive in terms of its public school curriculum. They had a woman by the name of Emma A. Thomas, who started sight singing, ear training, and vocals in the <coughs> elementary school as early as second grade. <coughs> And people were singing Hamill's Messiah by fifth and sixth grade. I mean, all these guys that I interviewed said we had, we had a sing in school, we had instrumental, we had band. It was really quite amazing. There was also, also something else going on besides this great history of, of musicians dating back to 1922, as, as far as I can tell. Um, there was something that I have written about as being a female-centered ethos. Jazz a, has been historically a male-dominated field, very cutthroat, very machismo, very competitive. In Detroit, there was no BS on the, bolts, on the, on the bandstand, but, um, but if, you, if you showed you were sincere and could play, people would take you and they would say, come over to my house, you, you need to work on this, and they were extremely supportive. So I think of it as a very female-centered model. And consequently, people were constantly playing all the joints, there's a ton of joints up and down all the streets, on the corners, in the late 40s and 50s, and people were playing with their elders and were constantly being tutored. And it was just a very supportive place where you can actually grow, develop a style, do it on the bandstand in front of an audience, and not feel intimidated. And plus, Detroit was centered between Chicago and New York, so the bands were constantly sweeping through Detroit on their way to the Midwest there. Uh, if they're going to the West Coast or through Kansas City. So it was just a very special place, Detroit. Um, in terms of Motown specifically, the, the jazz musicians that stayed were hired by Barry Gordy, and that's why the music's so great. I could just succinctly say that, that, that a lot of the guys like Benny Benjamin, a great drummer who played with the great Roland Hanna, stayed in town and, just, and, and, and worked Motown because it was a steady gig. And how many steady gigs do you have in jazz, really? Even then, it was, it was really a scuffle. So, great question. Um, I will finish. If I, any more questions? Or you want to hear the music? Yes. Well, I have a question. There's an interesting thing about Detroit. 
uh, Jerry McKenzie was a drummer with the Kenton Band. I saw them in St. Paul in uh, 1959 or 60. Okay. And uh, yeah. I noticed that he had uh, brown hair. So I went back to hear Kenton again at the same place, like a year or two later, and the the name was Jerry McKenzie, but he was a blonde, and didn't look the same at all. So I couldn't quite figure this out. Do you think I know about this? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> you give me far too much credit. <laughs> but I, but Do you have I, a chapter on hair color from this? No. <laughs> but Pepper was in Ken's band for six months. Maybe you know that. Maybe that's why you bring it up, or you just no. just sharing it. I'm just sharing. Yeah. yeah. I I bumped into the brunette's ex-wife. Okay. <laughs> at Dante's Jazz Bar. Dante's uh, in Hollywood? Yeah. You get around. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, my first question was, which Jerry McKenzie? And it was yeah. the, well, the brunette guy. Right. But the DJ, one of the big DJs in LA, didn't even know. Maybe there the were two of them. Transgender in America. Yeah. <laughs> but both, both of them spelled the name the same way, and they were both from Detroit. Okay. And they followed one another on the camp. Yeah, I don't know Jerry McKenzie, but there, uh, you know, there's some great, great players like Frank Rossellino, the trom great trombone yeah. player who played. He's from Detroit and played in uh, in, in, in Ken's band. Um, all right, so I'm going to finish with, if you'll indulge me, one last quote because I think this puts Pepper in perspective. You may get this from his music. I interviewed the, the great Detroit pianist Hank Jones. You probably know Dad's older brother, Elvin's older brother. And uh, in 1980, he said the following about a gig that he did, Fat Tuesdays, which led to a recording that they did, one of Pepper's last recording. He said, baritone was the instrument, the medium that he used to express his ideas, which were endless, absolutely endless and varied. I worked with him in Fat Tuesdays on a job, and I never ceased to be amazed. The flow of ideas, continuous flow, every chorus was, be was better than the last one. Now that's genius. An absolutely flawless execution. What else can you say? You see, there are lots of ways to play the instrument. You can play an instrument with what we like to say or describe as safe. That is, you don't take any chances. You don't go out on a limb. You play everything absolutely safe. Of course, you can get by like that. Pepper didn't play it safe. He got out on a limb. He took chances and always made it work harmonically, melodically, everything in every possible way. I've never heard anybody that played like that on a saxophone before. The man was just a total genius. The word genius carries with it many implications and connotations. When you say the man is a genius, that means he's capable of doing things that nobody else is capable of doing, or at least relatively few people. Charlie Parker had that same thing. Charlie Parker had an endless flow of ideas which he could execute flawlessly at any tempo with a tone that was impeccable. I was just always amazed. I used to get the impression that there was nothing that Pepper couldn't do. I got that same impression from Charlie Parker. There are probably things that he couldn't do, but if there were, I don't think anybody ever invented them. I never felt I was up to his standards, to tell you the truth. That's the most mind-boggling of all comments to make. I never felt he was up to, his, up to his standards. I was reaching to play with Pepper and play along with him. Pepper would extend your thinking, your abilities. That was part of, the, part of the greatness of Pepper. He would make you play. He would make you think more creatively because he was thinking and playing creatively. Thank you, and now the Andrew Spanner for you.